The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools and appliances just to find out what's inside. Today we are going to be tearing down what is hopefully a piece of history now, a fax machine. So we have with us the Panasonic KXF2700, which I think the easiest thing to do is get started. So I think a fax machine, especially one like this, which I haven't found an exact date of when it came out, I think this is either late 90s or early 2000s. Uh, I think this is going to be a very interesting one because not only have you got the, the analog dial-up uh, nature of it, but it's also got a digital answer machine on it. So it's going to have some analog to digital conversion for the voice. Uh, it's got thermal printer in it, obviously. Some mechanism for scanning. I don't really know too much about it. Uh, so yeah, there's going to be a lot, lot going on in here. Clearly at the bottom we've got an optical scanner. It's quite low resolution. You've got the paper feed mechanism. Uh, the idea being, of course, you put your document face down in here, scans it through, transmits it to the other end with varying degrees of success, like dial-up modem if somebody picked up the phone while you were trying to send a fax. It, of course, failed. Here's your first piece of history. This is thermal printer paper, which was a really late development. Apparently thermal printing was only invented in the 1970s. Now the most common place that you would probably see thermal printing today is like uh, receipts and things like that. But it was quite popular in fax machines from the 70s up until the late 90s. In the late 90s you started to see uh, inkjets and lasers or what was called indirect thermal printing. But I think thermal printing for a fax machine was actually quite a good match. It meant that you only had one consumable you had to buy and that was a roll of paper. And so long as your fax machine worked, it printed. You didn't have to worry about buying ink or toner or emptying an overflow cartridge drum or anything like that. So I think it was, it was quite a good idea. I mean, it had its limitations. Uh, in researching this episode, I found out that actually a lot of courts won't accept uh, thermal printer paper uh, in evidence or anything that's got to go to archive because the thermal material that is applied to the front of this paper degrades over time and delaminates from it. And there are the full guts of the printer. Right, first thing I will point out, this battery container for holding your memory when you had phone calls in what must be volatile memory. So if you lost power, you would lose all your messages had battery backup, had clearly leaked. Uh, the batteries were just shot to bits, the contacts are corroded. It's not looking good. <laughs> um, and also this part, when I received it, was actually rolling around inside the uh, case. Now there should be, and part of me thinks we're probably gonna find it in here somewhere. There should be a little toothed cog that goes between these two runners, which meant that on the top, these two parts should have been sort of synchronized to always center up the page when you move one the other would move i think we'll probably find it when we're looking let's attack the top see if we can get these uh these leads undone i mean it's interesting there's a cable tie there it's not really designed for repairability i don't really mind breaking the tabs off the plastic i have no intention of putting this back together i mean when was the last time you sent someone a fax have you ever sent someone a fax? Fax machines, I would say, were big from the beginning of the 1970s, although the first fax machines are much, much older than you probably think. Uh, the first patent for a facsimile or, or a, a machine that could transmit a copy of a document over wires, 1843. So the idea of a fax machine is like 100 and 70 years old at this point. Now that I didn't expect. What's really interesting though is that that was a mixture of an electromechanical system. So it was mechanically synchronized swinging arm sort of taking a reading off of a document and that pendulum effect was transmitted straight over to another synchronized pendulum that essentially dispersed ink in sympathy. Okay, so our first real look at any electronics. All tax switches actually. Um, I wouldn't, from the feel of the buttons on the front, which as you can see from this little mesh here, 
sit on these little spring-loaded sort of arrays. I don't think I actually would have guessed that these were tack switches, especially since that one seems to be a weird doubling up. So you've got the two layers here of a membrane keyboard. So you can definitely see two clear layers of uh, overlay, two little uh, contacts which get pressed together as you press the buttons, but they are sat on top of tack switches. And I have got literally no idea what the benefit of doubling those up is. Well, at the moment, there's not a lot of local pro... Okay. At this point, I'm not too sure, but it looks like they've done that for electrical isolation between the two systems. So the membrane keys plugged in here and go straight to this header, which plugged in here, which go down, goes down to the bottom. Whereas the tack switches come over here to this integrated circuit. I'm not quite sure what that is yet, but it goes over here and is arrayed and connected to this little display. So yeah, I, it, it appears on the face of it that the screen and the phone circuitry are two discrete systems, which I guess is technically possible. With touch tone phones, you're only generating an audible signal which is sent down the phone line. So there doesn't have to be any electrical connection between what's generating that signal and this digital side with the screen integrated in it and the analog side of the phone line. That seems really over-engineered to me but I guess it does keep your phone circuitry separate, which is actually quite a big deal when you've got an international product which works on different phone voltages and different phone systems around the world. It means that actually this module can be identical throughout the world, but because you've got electrical isolation between this and the analog phone signal, that's quite clever. I, I'd never have guessed that. That's a really clever solution to product production. Product production. <laughs> The, the roll of thermal paper sits in here and is fed through here. So this bar across here must have been pressed between this pinch roller. So that, I would guess, is the thermal head. So what there will be in here is lots of tiny, tiny little um, heating elements that are all individually addressable, which is kind of cool. I can't immediately think of a reason why I might want that, but equally, I think I want that. <laughs> There is a nice big thermal printing element. And I couldn't tell you what the resolution is. I seem to remember looking these up, those roughly 200 horizontal lines, uh, certainly for the more modern specifications of fax machines. Actually, that's, that's something to mention. So I, I seem to remember that faxes went through a number of variations through their life cycle. Type one and type two were analog. And in the 19, late 1960s, type three came along and turned into a digital format that further went on to type four, which was the last sort of really widely adopted standard. There were other standards that came along which offered various levels of compression, um, speed, uh, and even color. But I think color was one example of something which just never, never became standardized. I've, seen, I've, I've read that actually colored color adoption of fax machines was so bad that people found that you could generally only fax in color between two manufacturers or even machines of the same type, which doesn't say a lot for something which was otherwise fairly ubiquitous. Oh, yeah, I should mention, uh, when this is uh, stood the right way up, it really rocks on, for some reason, this screw head. Uh, and I've yet to work out what is behind this door. Uh, I don't know whether there's like a user upgradable module in here or somebody went in and just replaced it with whatever screw they had. Well, I'm interested to find out though. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, first guess would be that is a memory upgrade. I know, I know, I know I haven't got a proper DIN removal tool. Like I say, not intending to ever use this again. I'm not too worried if I bend the pins. Woo, it's a good job I didn't want to use this again. So that'll be some erasable memory. Uh, you can see the dip in the middle of the little chip. If I peel that off, there'll be a little exposed, so that'll be a UV, <laughs> UV erasable memory module. So at some point this had a firmware update, by the looks of things, uh, and firmware updates back in the day were fairly manual. So hopefully in the bottom we're gonna have a little bit more to look at electronically. Um, 
Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about phone lines or looked into it or had reason to look into it, but uh, it's worth actually checking out in your country how phone lines actually work. Because uh, you kind of, without thinking about it, would just sort of say, well, they're, they're an open circuit pair when not in use, but when they're in use, they're a closed circuit, but they're not quite like that because phones need to be able to dial and signal for a connection and things like that. So what you actually have is the phone line sitting there, in my country at least, at 50 volts nominally. Now, when you are trying to make another phone ring, it sends 70 volts down that line, and that will make every phone on the circuit ring. Uh, and when you're actually connected and talking, I think the phone line sits at about 40 volts. And when you hang up, it returns to the 50 volts. But uh, I always thought it was quite interesting that it's not just sort of how you'd expect. But yeah, it's worth finding out what it is in your local country because I think everyone is different as well. There we go. Our first look inside. I, yeah, wow. That is a well-populated board over here. So over here, this must be the analog board. It's got the phone line in at the back here. It's got the handset out here and the toggle switch on the side for uh, tone and pulse dialing. Because even though most people stopped using pulse dialing very long time ago, uh, most phone systems will use it, uh, will, will still work using pulse dialing. So if you're ever really, really stuck and for some reason have a physical phone rather than a mobile phone, you can actually dial pulsing the, uh, the, the receiver button. I don't know what it's called, the button under the receiver. There is one ribbon which goes all the way up and out the back. And I suspect if I pull that, that and that, it makes up half of that connector, which if I come over here, that plugged in there and made up. Yeah, that's such a funny little connection. So this ribbon pad went directly to the analog board and the tack switches that were underneath it go the other side down that ribbon to the digital electronics. So I mean, yeah, it's just it's a clever solution. I never would have thought of that. I like that. Okay, so this digital board has got couple of crystals for real-time clocks, uh, a little three volt battery for, uh, oh wow, a Z80 CPU. That's, uh, that puts a time frame on this, doesn't it? Uh, we've also got some RAM, which is going to be used not only for the Z80 CPU, but also some of this is gonna to go towards storage because the voicemails and the outgoing messages are all stored in volatile memory, hence why you have the four AA backup down here. So if they went, you lost your outgoing message and any recorded messages, you did not want that to happen. There's, what are these? These two little mirrors are the thing that are really throwing me. So there's a mirror across the back and there's a mirror at 45 degrees across here. And there's a mirror at the front as well. So the light comes up to this mirror, towards the back, towards this mirror, and then, oh, oh, wow. I did not expect that. What we have here is a lens. So this entire big empty plastic box, as I thought it was, is uh, the light path. It's the, the, the lens to the camera. So there's a little optical lens that on this board, right in the center, there's gonna be a little CCD or a CMOS sensor, but a little tiny spot one. I have no idea why, but I kind of always assumed that the sensor would be a linear array of not necessarily light dependent resistors, but light sensitive electronics in a single row of pixels, but the width of the page. So the fact that you've got a whole series of optics just designed to focus this down to a single spot. Well, I say single spot, that's still quite big. But when you consider that I was scanning a page this wide into a sensor just over an inch, an inch and a quarter. Wow, that's... Um, Surprising, although that does kind of explain a lot. The quality of fax machines and the optics were bad. Now it starts to make a bit more sense when you think that you had this plane of glass on the front that went down to this mirror at 45 degrees on the bottom, this mirror at the back, this mirror at the front, and every time you're reducing the optical size of the image that you're scanning, Every contaminant, every bit of dust on this smaller mirror is going to appear that much larger to the sensor. So any dust inside this box, which will have built up, I mean, there's a lot of bits in here already, and I can see dust on those mirrors, will have made a massive impact to the quality of the image picked up by that tiny little sensor. Okay, so here are the paper feed electronics. We've got two motors. 
So on the underside of this cog, which came off of here, not only has it got the, the eccentric connection for that cam, uh, the push rod, but it's also got this cam built into the back. So as it rotated and hit a very particular position, this micro switch was activated. So it fitted into that slot and it would also only turn in one direction which also makes it a really interesting choice to use a stepper motor. If you know rotationally exactly where you are, every revolution and every time that rod is pushed up and down, I don't really see the need for a stepper motor. You could have done that with a straight DC motor. But yeah, surprising. Oh, finally, because I tried to look up before I started the teardown when this machine was produced. Now, I appreciate this doesn't tell me exactly, but we finally found a date on this metal pressing from the 16th of June, 1996. So that dates this, like I said, to the mid 90s or at 96. They would have pressed hundreds of these without necessarily manufacturing the devices. So I'm, I'm happy with my assessment of late 90s. Just before we sort of sum up and talk about the electronics on this project, I just wanted to talk briefly about the quality and control. The use of stepper motors, which are calibrated at least once a revolution by micro switches, you would think would have a really good defined controlled rate of scanning versus rate of printing. However, before I took it apart, I printed up some, um, some detailed color images, which I thought would be uh, a good benchmark to see how good the quality of a copy is. And this is going to be reasonably equivalent the, to how you'd expect a scan to come through or a fax to come through when transmitted. Aside from the horrendous quality of the colour images, the compression I do know was very specifically designed to be good at handling documents and text. I think it's very equivalent to TIFF encoding. Um, and yeah, just one final demonstration. This is going to seem a little bit pyromaniac. Uh, just for anybody that's never experienced this, uh, you can probably do it with a receipt. Uh, certainly in the UK, a lot of train tickets are also done using thermal printing. That's where they get commonly used these days. Please be careful if you do want to try this. So the paper is actually coated in a chemical which reacts to heat. Uh, I believe it's called thermochromic paper. Uh, most people are happy just to call it thermal paper uh, or thermal printer paper. And that's just it. You heat it, it turns black. I think around this time in the late 90s, 1996, is when, in my personal experience, email and electronic communications just took off. I remember we got a computer in 1996 with a 28K modem in it. And almost the first thing we did with it is use the IBM fax utility, which came with it, to send a fax to someone without a fax machine. You didn't need to print it and scan it again. You just pressed from the uh, word fax. And that was it, it just went straight out. And I think that was definitely the start of the end for fax machines. As soon as people became competent and ex had decent access to high quality scanners, the need for signing a document and sending it over was lost as well. And that was kind of the last thing that fax machines were really good for was really signing documents. Uh, and that was kind of their appeal in the first place. It was the high speed communication, not just of pages and pages of written text, but the fact that you could get a handwritten signature on it. That's what made them useful. And as soon as computers and email became easy, accessible and cheap, fax machines were definitely going to head out. But it's nice to see a piece of history and there are some definitely clever stuff which I just wouldn't have expected. This linear sensor, uh, the dueling up and segregation, uh, an air gap between the analog and the digital inputs. I, I wouldn't have guessed that in a hundred years before tearing this down. I hope you found this one really interesting. I certainly have. Uh, if you have any ideas for a good teardown yourself, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching and I hope I see you next time.